Hey guys, this is MacHeads101, and today I want to talk a little bit about file compression. Now, file compression is something everyone uses pretty much every day, whether you know it or not, and I just kind of think that it's a lot simpler than people believe it is, and that it's actually pretty straightforward to at least understand kind of how compression is doing what it's doing. So what I want to do with this video is give a couple really simple examples, uh, and actually walk through how, how compression might work on them. The main example I'm going to be using is DNA sequences. And the reason this is such a good example is because uh, they're pretty simple. There's only four letters and an entire string of DNA is just made up of these four letters. So it's, it's good to be able to play around and give various examples. Let's start off by just talking about how we might encode a DNA sequence without any compression. Now this will seem probably pretty straightforward to a lot of you, but for people who haven't done any programming before, uh, this might be new. So, Let's say, just to start things off, that a DNA sequence is just made up of these four letters, and uh, each letter is equally probable, they're evenly distributed, it's just a random, you know, string of these letters, and uh, we just want to figure out how we can encode this as a string of ones and zeros, so that we can store it on a computer or send it over the internet, something like that. One way to do this is to just assign two bits, like a two-digit sequence, to each letter. So for G, I would have 0, 0, for C, I could have 0, 1, etc. I chose this randomly, you know, you can, you can assign whichever two-bit sequence you want to whichever letter, but the key is there's uh, four different ways you can combine two bits, and uh, I'm assigning one of those to each letter. So if I have a sequence like ACT, GCT, like I do here at the bottom, what I would do is I would look up what two-bit thing is A, what two-bit thing is C, etc., and I could write down a binary string for the, for the DNA. And this is how we would encode, uh, encode DNA using this very basic encoding scheme. There's no actual compression going on yet. This is just a way to encode DNA uh, without any compression. And it's really easy to decode because if I see a string of bits and I want to turn it back into DNA, I just look at the pairs of bits and can figure out which letter each one corresponds to. So now I want to consider a more complex example where different letters are actually uh, more or less likely. So I'm going to call this lumpy DNA sequences. And for instance, at the bottom I've included an example, you see that G is a lot more probable, and C is a lot more probable, and A and T don't happen as much. And so this is just an example of, of a very simple kind of data where uh, certain symbols are more probable than other symbols, happen more frequently. Uh, this is actually not uh, something I've just made up, like, for instance, the English language is, uh, is like this, where certain letters are much more frequent than others. So it might be really helpful to figure out a better way to encode this. Uh, than just our old scheme where each, each letter gets the same number of bits. So here is a way we could encode DNA uh, that's a little bit different than how we did it before where each thing was the same number of bits. So in this scheme, G, which is the most probable, is encoded as a single bit, it's just zero. And C, which is the second most probable, is encoded as two bits, it's one zero. And A and T are both encoded as three bits. And uh, at first, this might seem a little weird because I said G was zero. Like, uh, like so if, if you're encoding data and you see a G, you write a zero. You know, you send a zero as the next bit. Um, but then other things have zeros in them. Like C has a, has a zero in it. A has a zero in it. Um, so how do we, uh, how, like, how, how is this actually a valid code? Uh, so before I show you why this might actually be better than, um, than the old code we had where each thing was the same number of bits, I just want to demonstrate uh, that this actually is a valid code and that you can encode with it and decode with it. The way I'm going to demonstrate this is just by going through an example and hopefully you'll see, uh, you'll, you'll start to get a feel for how this is actually a valid code. So let's say we're given this string of binary that I have at the bottom of the screen here and we're told it was encoded as follows. If the encoder saw a G in the DNA sequence they were encoding, they sent a zero. If they saw a C, they sent a 1, 0. If they saw an A, they sent a 1, 1, 0, etc. And these are the bits we've now received from them, and we want to just figure out what were the letters they had been looking at before that caused them to generate this string of bits. So just to get right, right jump in, we're going to look at the first bit and figure out which letters uh, that could correspond to. So actually, if we look at all the codes for all the letters, all of the codes start with a 1 except for G. So we can immediately eliminate G, and we know it has to be one of these three letters, uh, because it couldn't have been a G. If, if the person had been looking at a G when they encoded this, there would be a zero there. Now we look at the next bit, which is a one, and so we know it can't be a C, because C starts with uh, one zero. So because we see one one right here, 
we know that it has to be one of the two things that starts with one one. And finally, looking at the third bit, it has to be an A because uh, A is the only thing that, that reads one one zero. So now we've figured out what the first letter the encoder saw was when they sent us the string of binary. An interesting thing to note is when we saw when we started looking at the string of binary, we didn't actually know how many bits the first letter would take up. It could have been one bit or two bits or three bits. But as we kept reading, it had to be three bits. Like it couldn't have been a, it couldn't have been two bits because that would mean it had to be a C, and it just wasn't a C. It didn't start with one zero. So now let's go ahead and try to read the second uh, the second letter. So we see a one, so it has to start with a one, and then we see a zero, so it has to be C. That's the only thing that starts with one zero. Let's do the third one. We see a one, so that narrows it down to three. We see another one, narrows it down to two, and then we see a third one. It has to be a T. And if we do this next one, it's a zero, so immediately it has to be a G. And you could continue this process, but the key is, at any given point, we've seen a bunch of bits, and uh, there's, you know, we can just figure out all of the letters that start with that string of bits, and, uh, and we can go off of that, and we can use that to decode. So we could have continued that process, and we would get this. So hopefully by now I've convinced you that it's actually possible to encode things like DNA or other kinds of data without the restriction of having the same number of bits for each letter. We can actually use a code like the one I've shown here uh, to have certain letters take up more space than other letters. And this is gonna be really important for our story about how compression works. The next thing I wanna do is demonstrate uh, that this code for the lumpy DNA sequences we've been working with is actually better than the original code. So if you'll recall the original code on average, we used two bits per letter because every letter was two bits. But now I want to figure out, on average, how many bits per letter uh, does this new code use in our lumpy DNA sequences? And to do that, we're going to use a weighted average. So 50% uh, of the time, we have one bit. So we're going to do 0.5 times 1. That just represents, you know, half of the time we have one bit. 25% of the time, we're going to be using two bits because C happens 25% of the time. You know, 25% of the letters in these lumpy sequences are C. So uh, we, we're going to add on to our weighted average 0.25 times 2 bits. And then the other two things uh, are 3 bits, but they each happen 12.5% of the time. So we can do 0.125 times 3, and we just add that twice. And this will give us a weighted average. It just, it's a measure of uh, if we encode a long string of DNA, um, and I tell you it is like 20 letters, I just want to know how many bits it will be. So uh, you know, how many bits the average letter takes up. And the answer, in this case, if we actually do the math like I've done here, is 1.75 bits per letter. And this is less than the answer we got with the original code where everything was two bits, because that was two bits per letter. And the reason we were able to do better uh, with lumpy DNA sequences than we could with the regular DNA sequences is because uh, we actually were able to utilize our knowledge of how frequently different things happen. At this point, I feel it's important to note that uh, this encoding scheme is actually only better for lumpy DNA sequences. So if we were to try to encode regular DNA sequences where all the letters happen, the same, the same probability, you know, the same distribution for every letter, uh, this would actually not do as well as encoding things as two bits each. Um, the reason it's better is because we're encoding lumpy DNA sequences with this lumpy code. So you kind of want to, you want the lumpiness of the code to match the lumpiness of the, of the data you're encoding in a sense. So now I kind of want to just move on and talk more generally about how compression might actually work in the real world, not just an example like this where we have these lumpy DNA sequences. So one very basic example is the English language. Um, if I want to compress a bunch of text, I'm probably going to want to encode it in such a way that common letters like E and T and I uh, are, are a lot smaller than, than the less frequent letters like Q. So Q might actually be pretty big, you know. It might take up a lot of bits, but since I don't have to encode it very often, uh, it's worth it because I can I can squeeze smaller, you know, I can make things like E and T take up less space, and they happen a lot more frequently. The way more advanced compression works uh, is it moves beyond this idea of letter by letter uh, compression, like we did with the DNA sequences, and it actually builds a dictionary. So a compression algorithm will look at the data it's about to compress. And maybe uh, it's, uh, let's, say, let's say it's English, because we all know English, presumably, if we're watching, watching this. Um, it, it might pick out certain words that happen a lot, or certain pairs of, of letters, or certain very common things, like uh, maybe CH happens a lot, because that's a, a common, uh, 
you know, pair of letters that appears in English, or maybe the word and happens a whole lot, or the word the happens a whole lot, it'll build this dictionary uh, of things like, of these words, and it will actually encode the dictionary such that really frequent entries of the dictionary take up less space than less frequent entries of the dictionary. And you can kind of imagine then getting creative, uh, because basically, the better, the better you can model and the better you can predict what's going to happen in your data, uh, the better you can compress it by, you know, making the, the likely things uh, smaller and the less likely things larger, which is kind of a consequence. You kind of have to do that. You can't get away with just making everything smaller. But anyway, that's kind of where I want to end things. I don't want to talk about too many specifics because then I would have to get into specific compression algorithms. But my idea was just to make uh, compression seem a little more accessible to you, to kind of get out the two main ideas, which is this idea of encoding things in binary uh, in a variable length way, so some things are longer than others, and the other idea of like pairing that with probabilities so that the likely things are smaller and the less likely things are bigger. But uh, this is just kind of a high level overview of how compression uh, happens and how your computer does it. So thanks for watching. Uh, hope you enjoyed and goodbye.